All right, we're gonna look at Boeing. A lot of people want me to look at Boeing. Let's read the 10K together. This is the first thing Warren Buffett does when he looks at a stock. He reads the 10K. Can't be that bad of a first step, right? I like to keep my notes in a file. Does it help you guys remember things? I remember things whether or not I take notes. I think it's good for collaborative work too. Like um, if you have a team, this is one of the better methods because your team can put their notes in and something like that. If you don't take notes, you lose the information from period to period. It's pretty hard to analyze these. You'd have to open up every 10K and stack them up against each other. It's, it's a little impractical. So better way to do it is to do it the way I'm doing it right now. All right, so at least it's at, at the time of the 10K, they had there's more recent information, but at the time of the 10K, they had 610 million shares outstanding. That's 175 bucks a share. So that's a hundred bill market cap. That's Boeing, BA, classic stock. I haven't been following the company for that long, but I, I've certainly looked at it for about 25 years, um, but never in great detail, you know? Uh, so I'm not going to pretend I was a Boeing analyst. I think for a hot minute, I, I did look at defense stocks, but not, not that in depth. It's funny because even, even with all their problems, they, didn't, they haven't really, yes, Boeing split a bunch of times, right? So like in the seventies, it was like a dollar kept going up in the nineties. It was like $36 and the dot com bubble peak. It was $40 kind of crashed, uh, to $20 went up all the way to 70 or $80. And was this when their problems started? No, that was just the great financial crisis. Back down again to $20, huge run, huge run to 200, even $400. Wow, wouldn't that have been amazing to buy Boeing? It's 2009, the financial crisis is over theoretically. Um, nobody has any job or money, but Imagine you had a big pile of money and you bought, you just said, you know what? I just want to buy American, classic American stocks. So I'm, I'm going to buy Boeing. And you bought a bunch of Boeing and maybe you bought Coca-Cola and Pfizer and all this stuff, but your Boeing stock would have gone from 20 to 400. <laughs> Holy moly. In just 10 years. Woo. You don't see that often. Yeah. You, you know, and it's not like some kind of high tech growth company. Like this is a company that is very old and whatever. Okay, so then the stock kind of crashed, I guess, because of various um, problems with the, the company's quality. Okay. Okay, so now we're left with a $100 billion company. What does that mean? They have commercial airplanes. That's one business. They have defense, space, and security. That's another business. And then they have global services. That's their third business. All right, so for airplanes, pretty, probably their easiest business to understand. You've got 737, narrow body, 767 wide body, 777 wide body, and 787 wide body. They're working on other planes, the 777X in development, uh, the 737X, 737-7 in development, and the 737-10 in development. For defense, they do what you would think, aircraft, manned and unmanned, commercial satellites, Global services, this is just servicing the other two businesses. They really have two businesses in a way. 171,000 employees and a bunch in the union, 57,000 union members. Hmm. All right, so they finally, look at that, they listed SpaceX as their competitor. Airbus is basically their, Airbus and some Chinese companies and then defense, they've got, Lockheed, Northrop, what's Northrop sticker? Is it still in SE? Raytheon, General Dynamics, and SpaceX. All right, so the 737-9 is, there's a ton of problems there. And then you have the 737 Max. 
Boeing was founded in 1916, 110 years old almost. So the FAA is the regulatory body for them. Non-U.S. customers accounted for 42% of our revenue. That's more than I would have thought, actually. 37% U.S. government contracts. So I'm guessing for defense, the entire thing is U.S. government contracts. Okay, so we've got the... The KC-46A tanker, the MQ-25, the T-7A Red Hawk, the VC-25B presidential aircraft. I'm guessing that is also called Air Force One. Let's see, VC-25B presidential aircraft. Oh, this is the military version of the Boeing 747. So that is also called Air Force One. Military 747. Tail number 28,000. Air traffic is back to pre-COVID levels, even though I guess China is not. Airline financial performance, I guess it's quite important for them. Industry-wide profit of 23 billion. It's more than I would have thought. 42,000 new airplanes over the next 20 years. Okay. 42,525 new airplanes needed globally in the next 20 years. This is the 2023 10K. Okay. Here is like a brief description of the companies. Really, really abridged. So they've grown, they've been growing revenue. Where's all the hate coming from? Why are there so many haters? Revenue was 62 billion, then 66 billion, then 77 billion. Okay, haters. Plebs get mad. <laughs> I'm not sure about the profit or loss. I want to look at the cash flow. You know what they call me. Okay, here's the disaggregation of revenue. Oh no, my windows went crazy. Airplanes, 14 billion, 26 billion, 34 billion. Defense, 26 billion, 23 billion, 25 billion. Okay, services, 16 billion, 17 or 18 billion, and then 19 billion. Oh, by the way, guys, I did. Um, I co-hosted Pirate Wires. So Pirate Wires is like basically, I guess, Peter Thiel's media company, or Founders Fund's media company. It's very cool, very edgy, and I co-hosted it this week. So check that out when it comes out. It should be coming out later today. So at least on a gap basis, all these businesses are seem to be running at a loss. But all of you guys know that that's not always the full story because you're smart and you know finance because you watch me and you're not a noob. All right, so this is the airplane backlog, which has grown enormously. The defense backlog, and then services backlog. Backlog is, how do they define backlog actually? It'd be interesting. Different companies define it differently. Unfilled orders. Definitive contracts have not been executed. Customers have the unilateral right to terminate. This is very important here. This is airplane deliveries. So we're gonna 737 deliveries. They delivered 396, uh, 387, and 263. Okay, that looks pretty good. 770, 747 deliveries. It looks like they don't do many of these. They deliver like none. Is that because is that the max? Or I don't know. It says here. I guess this, what is the 747? Boeing 747. Long range, wide bodied airliner. Oh, they no longer make it. It's the OG plane. Got it. 767. Oh, is that? Oh, I see. That's just the, that's just Air Force One. Got it, got it, got it. <laughs> I'll buy a 74, 747 when my puts print. <laughs> this guy is a fool. Julio Fulio. All right. 777 and then the 787. So if you look at how many planes they deliver in a year, it's not that many. These are pretty expensive little. So let's see, total airplane deliveries, right? 
is like delivering pizza. 340, 480, 528. Well, if this was a startup, that'd be a lot of growth, but I'm guessing 2019 and 2020 wasn't so good, but we'll see. So do I have those right? 340, 480, 528, cool. So these are firm orders, cumulative firm orders. Huh. I don't know if I can, <laughs> I don't know how to parse this. It seems strange. Cumulative first firm orders. So these are orders that accrue since the start of the project. Without deliveries, we have cumulative deliveries too, right? But is it cumulative net firm orders? I guess a firm order you can't cancel, right? Tell you what, I'm just gonna do the cumulative firm orders for the 737, because that's the biggest one. And if it's important, I will go back and finish the job. But I'm a little mystified as to how this will be useful, but that's because I'm not in defense and airline, uh, defense and air aircraft analyst. Okay, now we have the military side. It's going to be this is like a biotech income statement. So many different products or big pharma more likely. Okay, so the FA-18, what is that? McDonnell Douglas, that was an old uh, company Boeing bought a long time ago. 1997, McDonnell Douglas merges with Boeing. So are these all Hornets or are some of them Hornets and some of them aren't? We got the 18C, supersonic, so this would be a really cool industry to follow professionally. You know, imagine going to the Boeing uh, headquarters and they're like, take a look at this, the new FA-19. <laughs> and you're like, oh, and you have to get like security clearance to see it. Like the CEO's like, you want to take a ride? Let's go. <laughs> we'll go through the whole the whole list of products. So they said they, they plan to use the FA-18 until the early 2030s. It's the USMC. I'm guessing it's the US Military Command or something like that. Okay, so the 18 C and D, one crew member, 56 feet. How long is that? Height, 15 feet. You gotta be a short guy to fit in there. Short king. So let's see, if you had to scramble me from DC, how fast could I get to New York? DC to New York miles. Oh, that's short, uh, 200 miles. So you can cover that in what? What the top speed is, right? It is 1,190 miles. 204, 0.17, 0.17 times 60 minutes. So 10 minutes from New York to, uh, at, at full speed with no takeoff or landing kind of. Now I need that for my Miami trip. I don't think you want to be in that at Mach 1.8 either. <laughs> and for all of you people wondering, like, you could study all these and become like an independent analyst or join a hedge fund or a mutual fund and just be like, you're the nerd, you're the autistic nerd who's like, well, technically the F-18 uh, range is smaller than the F-15 and it uses the Hughes avionics to the Boeing avionics, which gives it a superiority. And like people, some hedge fund manager who's like, was a jock in college would be like, we need this kid. And then like, they'll put you in front of Boeing and Boeing will be like, how do you know so much about our planes, young man? <laughs> and you'll be like, I don't know. I've always been fascinated by them. And they'd be like, maybe you want a job with Boeing. And believe me, that's how this works. That's how I did pharma. In, in pharma, I, I was exactly the same way talking about every medicine, talking about every, they stopped shipping that or they're slowing down the shipping of that. Now the T7A Red Hawk. This is a training system. They've got two kinds of Chinooks. I'm gonna group those for simplicity's sake. All right, now we got the Apache. So the Apache is a helicopter. That's a flex. You know, these guys, these rappers, Andrew Tate, they're flexing Bugattis or whatever. Man, I got the Apache. Oh, I wanna know the price of all these as well. You can buy an Apache? I don't think you could buy an Apache. 52 mil. I mean, if, if you have a billion cash, that's not bad. Hellfire missiles, need those. These are a million a piece, I think. 
Although Anduril's probably going to make better ones. Anduril's the exciting company in defense. Maybe Boeing should buy Anduril and make Palmer the CEO of Boeing. Now that would be sick. Um, commercial sats. So the commercial satellite business, they've probably been destroyed by SpaceX, right? And on the military satellites, they haven't done any either there. So SpaceX has just been whooping in general. Okay, this is their earnings from operations for services, right? right, right. Okay. Now, the important part, cash flow. Oh, it's not bad, but they have CapEx. The thing about Boeing is that it's kind of too big to fail in a lot of ways. It's like the government, sweetheart. Like, if you work in the government, there's always a job for you at Boeing if you're in DOD or stuff like that. Oh, that's interesting. Someone's saying that the satellites are different heights. Fair enough, I suppose. All right, some real financials. Uh, this is... This I can sink my teeth into. This I'm the expert in. Find me a YouTuber who knows more about financial statements. Find me one. I challenge you. I've seen every kind of income statement, balance sheet, every kind of reconciliation, every country, every currency. Shkreli's done it. Canada's got some capitalism. You know, they're backpedaling for a while there. We'll see if they go full Soviet communism. I hope not. Our neighbors to the north, man, we need them. I need all the pretty girls from Montreal, all the pretty girls from Toronto. Oh, they got some businesses there. Other income. That's CIA bribes. <laughs> I'm kidding. A little other income. Don't worry about it. It's classified. I'd, I'd, I'd be kind of weirded out being a Boeing analyst on Wall Street. I'd ask the CFO some stuff and they'd be like, why are you asking so many questions? <laughs> like, it's my job. They'd be like, torture this man. <laughs> Follow this man right now. Sir, my stock pick is a matter of national security. <laughs> I'm on a need-to-know basis for your guidance, the assumptions in your guidance. So they've been unprofitable three years in a row, according to the income statement. But we know, because you're not a noob, you know the income statement is one half of the story, the other half is the cash flow statement. Gap, net income, is one thing. That's income statement. Cash flow statement sort of tells the truth without the accounting, but the accounting is sometimes important too. You can't take one without the other. Look at the inventories. We usually don't look at companies like this where their inventories are so large, but they have a year worth, a year's worth of revenue of inventories. In biopharma, you don't have that. In software, you don't even have anything close to that. So you don't even have inventories at all. So inventories, the problem with inventories is working capital, right? Inventory costs you money to make. You have to buy the raw supplies. You have to make the work in progress. Then you have to make the finished good. All of those cost capital, right? All of those are your money that you have to spend. So there's quite a uh, intensity. It's sometimes called capital intensity that comes with that. That's kind of why Boeing is like fundamentally business. We'll get into that later. There's a trade-off for having a monopoly. But take a look at the property, plant, and equipment, which I've told you guys many times is the one of the most important things. It's actually rather small relative to what I would have predicted. They only have 10 or $11 billion of capital. That's not that much. You would have thought a serious manufacturing company like this would have massive amounts of factories. That's odd to me. I wonder if it's made through you know subcontractors or something like that, but the margins are so low. Look at the gross margins, 10%. It's something's not adding up here. Cause I mean, I just don't understand the business model, but like you have a 10% gross margin as a manufacturer. That's less than, I mean, what kind of company has that low margins? With that low margins, you would think you have this massive CapEx. You know what it is? It's probably all these subcontractors. That's what's gotta be. Tons and tons and tons of subcontractors that are this guy makes the windshields, this guy makes the radar, this guy makes the seat, this guy makes the chassis, you know. That's that's probably what's going on there. All right, 137 in assets. How much debt? All right, so the inventory, you can kind of assuage that issue by getting these advances. So you can kind of make your customer pay for some of that inventory as it's progressing. So they're not completely out of their own pocket, so to speak. They have a huge uh, pension liability because the, 
They were such a uh, unionized company. Stockholders equity, negative. That's just an embarrassment, man. Boeing should have a fortress balance sheet, not have debt. That foreign governments can buy that debt in the open market. Come on, man. Okay, here is the all important cash flow statement. And I'm gonna do an abridged version because we don't have that much time. This was supposed to be a quick and dirty analysis, but I kind of got lost in the sauce, as they say. But here's the cash flow, and, and note the difference, right? You have, I'm gonna bold these two. So all you noobs out there, I know there's a few noobs that are watching. Most of you are seasoned pros because you've been watching me, but some of y'all are noobs, and I hate noobs. Net income, that is the profit left over after you deduct everything from revenue. That is the product you've sold, in this case, planes and missiles, all right? Sold $62 billion of planes and missiles. They had negative five billion, they lost money. Next year, 67 billion planes and missiles. But all the costs to make them, they lost five billion, okay? 78 billion in revenue, all the costs, negative two billion. So this makes it look like it's an unprofitable business. This is called the income statement, this is Gap accounting, generally accepted accounting principles, which means this is how you treat these numbers. These numbers just don't come out of nowhere. They're numbers that are, they have principles behind them. There's a second set of books called the cash flow statement. It has different principles. This basically, the income statement, is basically an idealized version of accounting principles that are meant to convey a certain set of thoughts. The cash flow statement is the same thing, but it's a different, it's conveying a different set of thoughts. In this case, it's conveying how much cash did we make this year? That is not the same thing as net income. Although they both are pointing to that number, one points at it from an accounting perspective, one points at it from a pure cash perspective. They're both important to look at. In this case, the cash flow from operations for Boeing was six billion if you look at the cash flow statement. But if you ask the same question, the same question of the income statement, it says negative two billion. So on one hand, we have six billion profit. On the other hand, we have negative two billion of net income. Somebody says accruals, yes. There are principles in the income statement that will lead to expenses being treated a certain way and revenue being treated a certain way. Um, and those differences can be big, as you can see. If you just look at the income statement, Boeing is losing money, they're unprofitable. What does that mean? If you look at the cash flow statement, they are profitable. They made $6 billion last year. They'll probably make more than that. Look at the trajectory. Negative three last year, or two years ago. Negative three billion. Then positive three billion. Then positive six billion. Okay, uh, what about CapEx? CapEx is important. CapEx is excluded from the income statement. So we can't look at cash flow from operations without giving some credence to CapEx. Let's give that credence. And we get something called free cash flow. Free cash flow number is a little smaller because we're excluding the capital equipment we've excluded that and it's still profitable at four billion i think you can take these numbers to the bank more than you can take the net income numbers to the bank so assuming that's the case let's look at the cash the business has they have 17 billion in cash let's look at the debt 52 in debt so the enterprise value is 142 billion this is december december yes okay so this is q4 2023, Q4 2024, obviously it hasn't happened yet. So we'll get that annual report in like six months. The enterprise value is 142 billion. For that, to, that would be the cost to buy Boeing and retire its debt. You get 4 billion in cash. What's that ratio like? Well, 32 times enterprise value to free cash flow. But is this free cash flow steady state, okay? Is this the number we can rely on. It doesn't look like it because it's so volatile. This number is going up and down like a yo-yo. And we've only looked at three years. That's why we're going to go back. 
and look at a couple more years. And we're going to think about the backlog a little bit. And we're going to think about U.S. defense spending a little bit. And then we're going to go on to another stock because I paid way much, way too much, spent way too much time on this. But when you look at a stock, you got to take your time, sink your teeth into it. You know, it's like that wine guy that looked at, you know, on, on Twitter. This is how you have to look at stocks. to look very carefully. Can't just race through it and make your trade like some maniac. That's how you lose money. Take it from me. I used to do a long time ago, I used to plan these trades out for months. Meticulous research, burning the midnight oil, cleaning lady came in and left. Second cleaning lady came in and left at midnight, the midnight shift. Security guards there at 2 a.m. looking at me like, and then guess what, the trade would work. Trade would work spectacularly. I'd make millions. Then what would happen? I'd start feeling myself and I'd say, you know what? I'm just gonna make a trade real quick. I like this stock. Ooh, lost 50 grand. That's no big deal, I'm still up. I'll make another trade real quick. Ooh, lost 200 grand on that. Before you know it, all the money's gone. You gotta keep your discipline. All the profits are gone. Don't, don't try to make you know, fortune in five minutes. If it were that easy, everybody would do it. Not saying you can't make money trading, you can, but you have to be extremely disciplined. All right, we can go through this one a lot faster because we've already read one of them, right? Well, some of the smartest people in the world invested in our company because our revenue is growing very rapidly and we're very talented and experienced managers. I built billion dollar companies before. We're actually about to raise five to 10 million, so. Okay, so look at that, the Boeing, had its worst year in 2020, really, really bad revenue, really, really bad deliveries. So they're kind of coming back from that terrible period of time. 730, wow, they used to move a lot of 737s. Look at this, 490, 529, 580. And then they dropped to like near halt. And then they went back up. So Boeing gets back on track be very cheap stock, let's take a look. But one question is like, if they're not delivering planes, who will, who is? Like, can they really get back to selling 500 planes a year? Clearly the market is satisfied by somebody else. That or like, there's just no planes. Yeah, I wanna look at Airbus's deliveries, obviously. Like these are long-term delivery schedules, right? These are not like you order a plane again next week. So yeah, plane deliveries for Boeing is well below the peak still. And I'm, I'm guessing they have the quarterly. Okay, so this does look like it's a net number that goes down. Oh, look at that. They, they had much higher margins at one point. Yeah, this is a cheap stock. It's gonna take a while for it to turn around probably. But like, this is an obviously cheap stock. Yeah, I don't, I don't see why you wouldn't have this in your portfolio, to be honest, because all they got to do is get their business back to where it was in 2016. It's just a question of how patient can you be? Because I don't think Boeing. I mean, they're on, they're on the mend. It's going to be a while before they turn around because it's, a, it's that kind of long-term business. And it's not, the funny thing about the stock market is if, if a process like a turnaround is going to take a long time, the stock market is a discounting machine. As long as that process is certain, the market will discount it immediately because the market's very smart. It's a very strange phenomenon, but it, it is the case. Sometimes the market has a little myopia and it's not as smart as it looks. And that's for us to take advantage of. But in general, the market's very, very quick about like, oh, okay, there's gonna be a turnaround and the stock will just double. And you'd be like, yeah, but the turnaround was, was supposed to happen over like 10 years. Market don't care. If it's uncertain, there'll be a turnaround or not. Different story. And if you don't know when the turnaround's gonna happen, it's gonna take forever and ever, different story. But, so they have peak margins, gross margins, 19%. That's 
crazy. All right, there's a uh, free cash flow right here, or cash flow from operations. Look at that. At one point, oh, did I skip over the other years of cash flow? Oh, 10 billion, 13 billion, 15 billion. CapEx. All right, so they had 14 billion peak free cash flow. So that's trading at 10 times prior peak free cash flow. Yeah, it's an okay stock. Some people like the safety of a big company that's got like this big brand. And Boeing has that. And I think that you could probably buy this stock and just forget about it, that you even have it for the next like 10 years or five years or something like that. And you could probably just do fine. If you're like a really active trader, you know, I hate giving like buy the stock type advice because like one of the problems is one, I mean, every investor is wrong a lot. Like, you don't just, um, there's no investor that only makes money. You get lucky, you get unlucky. You know, if I'm right 60% of the time, I'm thrilled. Yesterday was criticizing me over a stock pick I forgot I even made. I don't even know for sure if I made it. I was just like, look, man, there's nobody on the planet that can give you stock picks that work all the time. Even on Wall Street, even Steve Cohen, even the best of the best. This is not happening. Nobody will ever be that good. You know, so get that out of your head. So if you get a stock pick from somebody, you got to be pretty cautious about what that means. It doesn't mean drop everything and go, go do what they say. It means, you know, maybe I'll buy a little bit. Maybe I'll do some homework, maybe something like that. It's certainly not, you got to be crazy if you just want to go do what they say. And this is what the process looks like. I mean, you gotta look at hundreds of stocks before you buy one. That sound fun to you? If it sounds fun to you, do it. But if it doesn't sound fun to you and you think that sucks, you're in the wrong game. Being in the stock market, it, it's like going through a garage sale. Working in the markets is, is like going through a, a huge garage sale that never ends. A never ending garage sale. And you have to be happy at how big the garage sale is. Ideally, you want it as big as possible. And you're going through each stock, each little trinket, each little trinket in the garage sale. And you're looking for the one trinket that they mistakenly left out that's worth a ton of money. One of the tricky parts of Boeing is that they never were really operating at the scale they were operating at until they fell from grace. So that kind of makes it trickier to analyze the company because it's really hard to know. Like if they had decades where they were making that many claims, it'd be fine. And you just jump into the stock and ape in. But they never really were that at that scale ever. Right? So like they grew like in 2011, revenue was just 30, 36 billion. So it wasn't like they were killing it, you know? Oh, oh, wait a second, actually. I might have this wrong. This is just the airline revenue. Take it back. Okay, so they did they did have a period of time. What I said is still valid, but like they, they only have had a, a decade, 15 years, where they were selling that many planes. Well, they used to break out defense more carefully. Military aircraft, network and space, and services there. That defense business is very stable. 69 billion growing to 100 falling to wow fell a lot <laughs> to 58 which i don't know it was 10 years ago when they had that much revenue and now slowly going back up sometimes they call it kitchen sinking but in their very best year they generated 14 in cash flow yeah i'd buy this i don't know if i'd get the greatest return in the world but the safety of such a big company kind of compensates for the lower return i also would have to look at Airbus pretty carefully if I wanted to buy the stock because I want to see if they lost share or like the kind of good thing for them is that COVID happened around the same time of their, their safety problems. So like they normally would have lost a ton of shit. They ended up kind of, but again, these contracts play out over such long durations that it's not clear. I, I think they'll, I mean, clearly to, to play this stock, you, you just sort of have to have a sense for, is this turnaround happening or not? And that's, 
something that'll, you know, it could take many years. There are many examples of companies like this that sort of had these big problems. Johnson & Johnson had them for many years. There was a company called American Home Products that had one a long time ago that I was knee deep in. Amex had one very famously that Warren Buffett took advantage of. So like there isn't necessarily uh, quality issues are sometimes great opportunities. Quality issues can be solved. If they linger long enough, it hurts the brand. But Boeing has a brand that's are you really not going to take a Boeing airplane? No, I don't think Boeing's brand is long as, as low as it can be. I, I still go on a Boeing airplane. Stranded astronauts, not good. All right, this is kind of interesting. Like, before their peak, 2018, they were doing like six or seven or eight of free cash flow. So one has to wonder, is that more steady state representative of the kind of cash flow you can expect from Boeing? If that's the case, let's call it seven. That's not cheap. So you really got to understand the airline business, commercial airplane business, because, and I don't. Why in 2018 and 2017 did they have such big earnings? Well, it's not too expensive. Like I'm, it's very like, it's like very attractive in some ways, but like, it's not, you know, jump up and down by this tomorrow kind of thing. It's a tough one for me, especially since I don't know the space. No pun intended. Okay, what other stocks should I look at? I'm gonna ask my Godel, my Godelians. These guys have had great stock picks, honestly. Um, they gave me Iovance and they gave me um, Zoom. 